I'll be quiet. And do we still have a, a guest coming? You're mute, Diantha. Sorry, I muted so I'd stop talking. <laughs> Ned Galloway is joining us. He should be coming in any minute. Um, and we did have, I'm just thinking, Tim Campbell was listening. Um, Michaela worked that out, I think, right, Michaela, that Tim Campbell wanted to be able to hear the discussion. So he's um, listening and so Ned should pop up here in just a few minutes. Okay. Ned wanted to follow the discussion because he hasn't been able to join us um, for our discussions around um, the Charlotte Humphreys Park and some of the and Boys and Girls Club and all. So that's really good. Okay, well, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Uh, I'm Cynthia Neff. I get to chair this lovely CAC and work with all of you lovely folks. Um, now is the time for my, the, the required reading, which says why we have, why we're doing it like this. And, and one day we'll have to talk about, do we think we're ever gonna to get together in per, person again? Um, the, the, the meeting is being held uh, pursuant to and in compliance with emergency order number 20-A16, an emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster and probably for the rest of my life. Um, the committee members who are electronically present at this meeting are, I'm going to go ahead and call um, order. If everybody would um, raise their hand, Rosemary, if you or Michaela could keep track because I'm going to my computer screen. Cynthia Neff, I'm here. Yolanda Speed, please stay here if you're here. Here. Yay. Kimberly Swanson. Here. Michael Corrigan. Jacqueline Salazar. I think she's in the car, isn't she? Hello? Jacqueline, I, we saw her just a few minutes ago. And real quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Michaela, um, Sam's trying to get in and she don't, can't find her link. Would you mind sharing the link with Sam Strong again? And I'm apologize. I'll email her. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Rosemary Miller. Here. John Lewis. Who's Jack? Here. James Clemenko. Here. Diantha McKeel. Here. Samantha Strong, almost. John Neal. John. Vito Chetta, I know is not here. Jane Fogelman, mm -hmm. I know is also not here. They both let me know. Bill Love. Here. Michelle Busby. Chris Rembold. Here. And Julian Bivens. Okay. So that's what the, the majority of us are here. Um, additionally, we have some people from the staff. The county staff members are Cameron Langill, Kevin McDermott, Amy Smith, Carolyn Schaefer, and Michaela Accardi. And then we also have James Pierce, who I am a huge fan of, who runs the Boys and Girls Club and is here to talk about. It. We have a great agenda tonight. I, I really am looking forward to this because, you know, we're going to talk about the boys and girls, you know, plan to move into our great little school space, the Charlotte Humphreys Park and get an update on that. And then Kevin's going to talk to us about our, our uh, sidewalk project that we're just waiting to hear about. So anyway, we've got a great meeting coming up. And without any further ado, who am I turning it over to? I am turning it, oh, I'm not turning it over to anybody because we have to approve the minutes, which we, you know, cherish Rosemary for. Has everybody had a chance to look at the, the minutes and the agenda and all this stuff? If anybody would like to make an amendment to the uh, minutes. Okay, I'm looking at everybody. Um, if not, I'd love for someone to make a motion that we improve the uh, minutes as as written. This is this is Yolanda Speed. I so move that we accept the minutes as presented. Thank you, dear. A second. 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 All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 
Okay, we're going to call that unanimous unless somebody wants to speak up now and say uh, otherwise. Okay. Um, I think now we are actually ready to introduce James Pierce, LJ Lopez, who is with, um, I forget, Milestone Partners. And we also have Cameron here from the staff who's helping manage this project. But James, it is lovely to see you again and uh, can't wait to hear an update. Likewise, Madam Chair, members of the committee, it's my pleasure to be here. I'd like to also introduce again, LJ. Um, thanks for being here, LJ, Milestone. Um, I just first want to say thank you for your service to the community. It is a, um, a privilege to be able to talk to people who dedicated their, their own personal time to help us, to help others. And um, my goal tonight is to share with you updates on the uh, current footprint of, uh, of the club. I'm getting a little feedback. Is anybody getting feedback? Yeah, everybody, if everybody could mute their... Okay, I'm not hearing it now. Is that good? Great. Um, so again, uh, thanks. My goal is to just take you through the slide deck that we have that gives an overview of how the new club is laying out, what the goals are of the new club, and then uh, certainly hear, uh, hear your thoughts and feedback. So um, uh, before I bring up the, the uh, slides that I want to show, just some dates to know. We're breaking ground in June 2021. Um, that is right around the corner. Very excited about all the county support that we have received to this point. Uh, that means that we have a target date for completion and opening with the school year of 2022. So we'll have uh, construction for just over a year. We have a terrific partnership right now with Albemarle County Schools and certainly with the Board of Supervisors. I want to thank the Board of Supervisors and the school board for all of their support to this point. Uh, when the site is completed, we'll have 300 members per day, ages 6 through 18, who will have an after-school and out-of-school time home. So uh, right now, we anticipate that that's going to shake out to about five or 600 members. Remember, not every member comes every single day. Um, and this was on the heels of a 2017 school board report that showed that there were over 1,000 kids in Albemarle County who would make use of an out-of-school time. Uh, environment like the Boys and Girls Club and others um, if it were made available. So this is our uh, organization's attempt to answer that call in partnership with all of you and all the previous partners that I just mentioned. Again, right now uh, at the Jewett Club, we do run a small club inside the school. I should say we do. We, in normal times, we run a club inside of Jewett Middle School. Right now, that club is actually at Fry's Spring Beach Club, believe it or not. Um, as we are not inhabiting any uh, Albemarle County schools. So we have made do during this pandemic and uh, are doing our best, but uh, we can't wait to get back in person with kids. So um, when the club opens, it will have, we, we, were, we are building it for our uses, but we're certainly not the only user. We envision community groups using the club. We envision the schools using the club during the daytime and uh, for professional development, for gym, for, you know, any different use. Today I had a conversation with an Albemarle County um, school, school person about adult education possibly um, taking place on, uh, in, ground, in, our, in, our, in our club during the daytime. All right, get to the point, James, here you go. All right, um, so here is, move you all around here. Here's our our partner list, and then you know, here here we are on campus. You all know this is the most populated campus in Albemarle, in Albemarle County Schools. We will be in the dotted blue line here, just to orient you: Albemarle County High School, Jewett Middle School, and Greer Elementary. This is the current site of the uh, driver's education range that's outlined in blue. Uh, we did have one a previously identified site. That site's been moved to the one that I just notified you about here. You might be interested in this. This is the walking plan. So um, orange is elementary from Greer, red is walking routes from Jewett, and blue identified walking routes from Albemarle High School and how kids would access the facility. It has a two-sided lobby. You can see members enter from one side or the other side depending on their age. Uh, and here's car access throughout the facility. So it has a two-sided parking lot. 
here and then uh, bus loop with the existing bus loop here. And then we've got a two sided entry parking lot here next to our lovely field that's happening out in the back. Uh, this is just an overview of some of the exterior spaces on the on the grounds of our new club. Uh, the blue is the hard built uh, building and then the white spaces are purposefully built uh, integrated program spaces and then we've got a sports field and certainly access to this terrific uh, uh, network of trails behind the facility and the wonderful woods. Here's an image a little more specific to the current uh, satellite view from so you can see exactly how it will sit based on current topography there. Here's one view of what it will look like when it's complete. Uh, it will not probably be a white building, but this is just for uh, images sake. And then here's one from the other direction. You can see the field in the back. And you can see the two sided entry lobby here. Now we get into some of the architects renderings. This is the entryway from the Greer and Jewett side. Here we have the exterior teen uh, court. This is the teen center inside, and then we're envisioning some artwork, so a changeable mural against this wall outside the gymnasium. I love the seat wall that surrounds the space. To the right here is the art room and the STEM room, and this is the cafe inside where I'm putting the cursor now. This space will be terrific for us because it represents um, a place for us to do our messy programs right outside those art, art and STEM rooms. Uh, we have some terrific egg drop things and, and all kinds of artwork that gets kids moving and, and active and we'd like to have some space to expand outside for that. This will also be terrific when we have uh, lunch at the club because our cafe is big, but to have the ability to expand and have two or three groups out here to eat will also be good. Every, every space in the club has to serve multiple uses and uh, this deck is no exception. The next slide is just down from this deck, so orient yourself that way. This is the lower level behind the club, so the woods are to the left here and uh, the right is the lower level. So this is a terrace, which has many uses for us as far as program spaces as well. At the end of this terrace is the bowl. And this is that bowl. It's about a 40 foot drop between street level and the ground level here. We love the way that this is turned out with like an amphitheater style, a uh, couple of ledges throughout where we know we're gonna have the whole club membership in case we need to do um, uh, and that whole club announcements or gatherings of small groups, we, we have a built-in kind of natural amphitheater out here. I also love the fact that we're able to do not just sports, but other activities on this um, defined space out here. This is more adjacent to the youth side rather than the teen side. So this is the equivalent of that uh, teen courtyard that I showed you for, uh, but for younger kids. Here's just a quick shot of the, um, of the field. And you can see it's got a, a slight slope here. And then it's a really flat space here. We, we are gonna make so much use of this. And again, we think it'll be used on weekends um, during the day by schools, certainly by us during our program time. Um, this is again, a shot off the back of the, uh, the terrace going down into the trail network. We have a, a abundance of outdoor program space, uh, programs that will be happening out, out in the back. And then once you're back into the trail network, this is looking back up at the facility. A um, little bit of a specific view of what's going to happen inside the building. Um, we have two, anything that's pink is going to be multi-age. So anybody, any age can use it. The blue is specifically for our younger members and the green is specifically for our teens, for our older teens. So, um, this is the only boys and girls club I know of that's going to have two gymnasia. Uh, very happy about that. Indoor spaces and again, useful by the many schools that, that are running programs on the campus. But it was important for us to have a dedicated youth gym uh, because often there's conflict or we're pulling a curtain across and having half the gym be teens and half be younger kids at other clubs. And so we're, we're thrilled to have actually three fitness spaces in this. And I'll tell you about the third one in a minute. Cafeteria here, uh, cooking um, instructional kitchen here during the day. Um, we hope that that will be used by local entrepreneurs or um, school system projects, programs that have use for that and an instructional space right next to it. STEM room here, art room, and then two closed door program spaces for, um, for teen programs, two small groups for homework, for uh, small career clusters, and then a teen lounge that leads out to that outdoor space. Um, over on the youth side, five closed door program spaces and one large games room. 
Um, next floor down is the squash floor, and this is a little bit out of date. It's actually going to be a larger area. I can't wait to bring, uh, we actually already have a currently running squash program at the Boar's Head, where we take members from this club to the Boar's Head. We've done it for about three years now, and we're so happy to be able to bring this, um, this club in-house, uh, this program in-house. And um, squash courts also double as terrific aerobic studios, dance studios, uh, learn how to throw the ball, learn how to catch. These are going to be very useful spaces for us. And on the top floor, if you've seen one office, you've seen an, you've seen many offices. It's a long hallway with offices on both sides. This will house the um, headquarters of our organization. We're moving it from the Cherry Avenue Club uh, on the campus of Buford over here to the new club, the Albemarle Campus Club. There's some exterior character starting to take, take shape here. Uh, nothing to define yet. And then we'll finish with uh, three or four pictures of interior spaces. This is a typical um, program room. There are about eight or nine of these that you saw throughout the presentation. Here's just from another angle looking out to the back. This is the games room on the junior side, the cafe space, which will be used by all ages and for many purposes. Uh, we love our gymnasium. Love it. And then we've got a teen space here. This will be a, a rendering of the, the, the large teen lounge and then two shots of the, um, the squash facility in the basement. So again, I can flip back to any one of these at any time and I'm happy to bring it back up, but wanted to um, open up to questions and um, hear from you all about any questions you might have. Hi, Bill. Yeah, hi, I, I just wonder if this slide presentation will be available to us afterward to look at it a little more leisurely. Yes, um, I'm conscious of time here. I have been accused of being able to spend three hours talking about this plan. And so I've tried to buzz quickly through it. I know there are a lot of questions. I would just request that we have one more, uh, one more week to get you the most updated version of this that we can get you, because there are a few things that are a little bit different from what I showed you that are gonna make it, if it's in your hands, I want it to be right. So yes, absolutely. I will follow up on that and I will look to LJ to tell me when. We had a question in the chat, James, that is from Yolanda asking, are all spaces accessible for limited mobility patrons? Um, we have had a, a, a two or three committee members sitting around the table who have made that an emphasis, a point of emphasis from the very beginning. And so, yes, there will be access. I cannot think of a space. Even the squash courts are um, accessible, I believe, for all populations. LJ is nodding his head, so he's my ultimate barometer on this. Great, thank you, Yolanda, for your question. Um, inclusion is a main goal here. Hi, Rosemary. Hey, um, I know you guys moved your building from the old space and we had seen that one too. I was wondering if there's anything you guys are missing by moving this. It seems like a really logical new space board and like perfectly fits in the campus. I was wondering if there's anything you lost by moving to the new location. Oh, wow. Or, or is it all gains? Uh, no, we didn't, we didn't lose anything. Um, really, we are so grateful for the, for the location change. And um, thank you for that question. I think what we, what we gained clearly is a lot more visibility from, from the campus. It was kind of tucked behind and hidden and I was concerned that maybe kids wouldn't be able to access it or, you know, it was too far back in there or, you know, we lost, we lost a lot of the slope. There was a lot of kind of downhill slope to get into the area. And um, again, LJ, any thoughts on maybe what we lost? Uh, the only thing I, uh, we lost was time and time is not anything we could control, uh, but we lost time. Uh, we gained far more in programming and visibility and, I think value to the club and to the uh, school campus. I think it's gonna be great to be able to see that right when you come in. Hi, James. Um, oh, no, go um, okay. A question I have about the kitchen or the cafe facility. I'm also on the board of KTEC, so I'm always thinking of their culinary arts program. And I was just wondering, are you gonna contract for those services or are, are you going to hire? I'm just thinking ahead about flexibility and maybe engaging our culinary arts students at some you point. You know, 
Kate, I, I, I am so glad you're here and asked that question. We're looking for partners and, you know, whether it's this, whether it's this club or any other club, we would love to partner more with KTEC. I think it makes really good sense to have a partnership with KTEC right on the site of the most populated campus in, in the Admiral School System. So um, I would look forward to a conversation on that. Those are exactly the kinds of conversations we want to be having at this, at this time. Well, I'd love to connect. Yeah, I would love to make that connection, even if it's episodically for treats. And, and, and But there's also a food bus. We have a food truck, a food bus. And, you know, you could think of family events where the food bus was parked out in the really awful parking lot. Not yours, but our campuses. But I, I can see that that could be a good partnership. I think it would also be a great opportunity for kids from the Albemarle School System to see that that KTEC is an option, that there's things that they can do and, and pursue as they, as they go forward and might get inspired by it. So I think it's, it's a win-win if we can make that work. It's great. And, you know, we, we do snacks and meals. We serve, you know, 50,000 a year. Okay. And, and so, you know, if there's a way to contract with KTEC, you know, right now we use Pearl Island for a lot of our, um, for a lot of our business. Um, to have something on site, like like you all said, to to model some of the options for what's out there for Albemarle County students, uh, I think this is a, a ripe opportunity. I have written it down, and we'll be following up. <laughs> so Anybody you, else have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, Wait, let John go first, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. No, uh, excited about the move as well. Uh, and, and largely because it saves trails over by the backside Jewett fields. It's a lovely part of the forest. I'm happy that it will stay forest. Um, there is a trail access right sort of at the corner where it looks like the entrance is going to be right before you, I think it's the corner right before you start to turn towards the Jewett and Ivy, the other school. Um, if you go back to the map, yeah, there. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any plans behind to, to replace or, or think about public access or another place to access the trails from the right side of the building on this drawing. We're talking about this one. John, I have a, a crack trail person who's a part of our team and I will ask her about this. Uh, she, it, it sounds like um, she knows almost as much about this as, as you might. So I might write your name down and ask if we can follow up with you about that, either way, I will I will research it on my own and get back to you, uh, get back to this committee about that question. Yeah, and it, it, this it, one it, right yeah, here. Yeah, that's a corner that people currently drop into the trail, and it's not obviously your building is has much more value than a single trailhead. But you know, just thinking to the future and the kids, they like to be in the trails and then come out in that area, and it may be steeper closer to the baseball field. Um, so. Again, just something to consider is just how do, how do people get from that parking lot onto the trail system if you've got the field and the building in the way, so. Okay, and, and just so I understand, this, this where I've got the cursor now is the spot you're talking about? That's one of them uh, okay. where people tend to access that, that trail system. The others are behind Jewett or behind Greer, but that, or, or on the other side of the baseball field where they climb up. But that is one of the put-ins and, and, and probably the more visible one, of, or the, but I don't know how often it's used compared to the other ones. It's just something to consider is how, how would people get on and off the trails that connect that area? Um, maybe, so maybe, I mean, I'm, happy, maybe. I'm happy to work with anyone to sort of walk through it or beat some of the people from the, the high school mountain biking team who use that area a lot these days. Great idea. I think it's also an opportunity for signage and extra marking and just drawing attention. So thank you, John. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks. Great. Diantha, you oh, go ahead. Let Chris, we'll go. Go to Chris. Let Chris go first and then okay, I'll go. Chris, you're next. This, this is sort of a lead into the second half of our meeting, but um, has the Boys and Girls Club thought about um, access that's not by car to their facility? And that can we get figure, figure out ways that there are going to be walking trails, not just from the schools, but also into the neighborhoods locally? Chris, this is a great point, and we're big fans of the Safe Routes to School program uh, for many decades, and love the fact that this is on the, we're on the same agenda. Um, we would be happy to work with anybody from Safe Routes. We have had conversations. I know LJ might have a, a 
more recent update than I do, but uh, we actually rely on this committee to give us a lot of feedback on what's happening with safe routes. And um, so yes, is the, is the short answer we, we're happy to work with. And, and uh, the more walkable this campus is, the more we can access all of the surrounding neighborhoods. And I think um, takes advantage of the centrality of where this is located between all the neighborhoods around. Yeah, very cool. Um, and just to my one of my comments is is um, relates to that a little bit. We have as an upcoming agenda item for the CAC, Rivanna is coming to talk about the pipeline and the trail uh, because over that pipeline that's going in, and I recognize it's going in kind of on the other side, James. <laughs> um, but it will be you know we're planning on a multi path use path over that trail. It might be um, great if when we have that presentation, if you or someone from the Boys and Girls Club would like to attend the meeting, just because it's always good when we all know what we're doing <laughs> and to ha be, have eyes on where all those trails might be and how they might connect. So we, I'm happy to let you know when we're gonna have that presentation. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Is that over behind the other proposed, the, the previous site? Yeah, what, well, what ha will happen is the, the ride, supposedly right now, the plan is for the pipeline to come down behind um, Greer and Jewett and head across. So mm -hmm. it really won't come back behind you all so much, but it would really be nice to have you all at the table when we give that presentation, just to make sure that everybody knows where the trails are and there may be some connections we're not even thinking about, right? Yeah. So, I, if, Michaela, if you could just help me remember to let James know when we have that on the agenda. Um, and I wanted to just ask a couple of quick things. I think you may have alluded to it, but want to make sure that everybody knows that, James, I think that you all have anticipated that sometimes the schools, teachers, administrators, and sometimes the community will be able to use some of your space for meetings. Well, obviously, when you all aren't using it, I just wanted to, for like a, a neighborhood association meeting, or I sometimes have meetings around a traffic issue with people from the community. So there will be a space that could be used for some of those outside meetings as well. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm happy to put an exclamation point on that remark. Um, yep. In fact, we would be disappointed if we weren't seen as a community center like this. Um, uh, we want to be useful for so many different organizations, concentric circles. So boys and girls club use, community kid use, and then community use tends to be our priority uh, order that we make decisions. And, and as long as it involves a community issue uh, or is a, is a partner agency issue, we would love to host um, any of those meetings that you just, that you just noted plus more. So, uh, Diantha, I'll put a... I'm sorry, uh, just to uh, jump in on that, put a finer uh, point on that. You will see us again uh, in the near future. Um, we are going to be initiating our special use permit to allow just those uses. So based on public schools and current zoning of the campus, the club um, itself and the club's primary activities are a buy right use. The secondary community supported activities um, the Boy Scouts, the, um, you know, and any other uh, community organization that wants to utilize the facility that could partner with the club and the club has on other facilities and would, is, as James indicated, uh, more than willing to support those uses and wants to see those, um, the facility utilized in such a manner. Uh, we're coming back for request for um, those special uses to be allowed. So we'll have the community meeting and um, we'll be seeing you at a future planning commission and board of supervisors meeting for that approval. Right, and I know we're running close on time, Cynthia. Just one more quick thing. Yeah. I was at Greer today taking a tour because it was lovely to see the schools with children in them. And the principal at Greer mentioned the wackadoodle parking and the, the craziness that we've all talked about about that Parking, certainly Bill is familiar with it just from the Board of Elections and trying to deal with it as a polling center. You all are coordinating a little bit with the schools around as you're thinking about this parking and driving. Yes, yep. I see. Yeah, uh, so um, we met with all um, 
uh, campus principals uh, matrix of um, bus arrivals and departures and the sequencing and when the club starts and when students are walking. And so a lot of those um, early uh, slides that James showed for walking routes, car routes, bus routes, and that sequencing was all taken into account for a, a very uh, finely orchestrated um, bus entrance and exit for you know student uh, drop off and pick up and when uh, club buses do arrive and making sure that parent pick up and the, the timing. Are there going to be points of, of congestion? Yes, that are not avoidable, but this was um, the best plan and site layout that accommodated all of the existing uh, time and uses. Great, thank you, I appreciate it. Great report. That was great. Can I ask one more quick question uh, along the programming line? Okay. Um, and, and with the, uh, the other uses, uh, could the county also, county's parks and recs program partner to use that space for like their adult fitness programs? Because right now they're kind of scattered throughout the county. Yeah, no, nobody knows what a congested uh, field space uh, schedule looks like more than people who work on this campus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've had so many experiences with my own kids, other kids, you know, high school people around, there's so much use on this space. So by adding two gymnasium, a squash facility and a large outdoor playing field, we hope that we can provide, of course, the Boys and Girls Club to have more space, but we want this to be space that expands the uses that are already known. So whether that's Albemarle schools, whether that's adult fitness, parks and rec, we, we would not be here without partners. And so I would, uh, I, I'm gonna, Kim, I'm gonna write that one down as well. And hopefully we can follow up um, to, to talk about how uh, we might work. You said um, adult fitness. Yeah, the adult fitness. Yep. yep. Um, you know, I, it tends to be that adults use uh, spaces or can use them later than kids. So, you know, we at our Cherry Avenue facility and others that we have to say grace over the actual schedule. Um, we are like we've got volley, adult volleyball running at Cherry Avenue um, pre-COVID times, and so that's just one example of many. Um, and I would, I would hope that we can reach out and talk more about how we might partner. Well, I don't think anybody can say that James and LJ and the whole team don't have everybody's best interests at heart. So thank you awesome. so much for taking time out of your evening. Thanks to Cameron, LJ and James. We appreciate you coming. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, thank you very and, much. And then the next thing we're gonna talk about is Charlotte Humphreys Park, our dearly Beloved Bill Love just said he went on a walk there and got to experience how big it is and how cool it is. So um, we have Amy Smith, who's the Assistant Director of Parks and Recs for the county and our very own Kim Swanson, who has been working on this for since the beginning. So take it away, Kim and Amy. All righty. So um, I was going to run through just a quick timeline and um, Amy can help me with filling in from her side of things, uh, timelines uh, for other additional work. So uh, you all know the Charlotte Humphreys Park, um, named after a former uh, supervisor. Um, and we set out um, in about 20, 2017 um, with the CICs getting neighborhood improvement funding um, to look at uh, projects that we could all agree on as a, as a good place to focus our energy. And it was a very deliberative process. And what, what rose to the top in the, in the ranking was the Charlotte Humphreys Park. Um, then in the September of 2018, they, the county completed a parks and rec needs assessment throughout the entire county. But then we invited Dan Mahone, the uh, outdoor rec supervisor to come and give a presentation on that assessment and how it fits, how Charlotte Humphreys fits into the county's park system. Since it is so unique in its positioning as an urban park, um, we are really in a, a great position to, to, to help it uh, be a good destination for the surrounding uh, immediate community. 
So the park itself is 23 acres uh, with about one and a half miles of paved trails. Uh, there's a forested portion um, towards the back is a, uh, a meadowed, uh, more open area, and then there's also a wetland area. And the, the county's Parks and Rec Department is responsible for property upkeep and maintenance, um, which primarily is consisting of trail and hazard tree management, that there are no amenities um, to speak of at this facility. Then once we really committed to the, to the park, uh, we had an all hands on deck meeting. And so at this point, the, the CAC members had sort of nominated me to help with spearheading this. And we got a group of people to all meet at the county office building um, to, to really kind of talk out what, what kinds of things we can do sort of quickly to make the park feel a little bit more inviting. And then longer term, what other improvements we could, we could consider adding. And so we learned that there was potentially some uh, funding that was gonna occur in the FY20 budget that would have been dedicated for the Charlotte Humphreys Park, which was a really great um, thing to learn. And then we, we talked about some quick cleanup projects that could be done in-house. And we also wanted to seek out a survey uh, with the immediate neighborhood to find what find out what other kinds of amenities people might want. And then I was going to reach out to other community organizations to see how they might be willing to uh, work with us on the park. So the work began in earnest in July of 2019. We did get the funding approved. Um, I met with the former supervisor of parks, Matt Smith, and we talked about those short-term improvements to the facility. Um, and then we had met again with David Powell, just as a brief meeting with, he's with the Department of Forestry to talk about how we could embark on a forest management plan. Um, and the Parks and Rec in that same year, uh, December, from November to December, conducted a survey uh, with the neighborhoods um, in the immediate area uh, to find out what, what people might be interested in. So here's an image of that, that immediate work that was accomplished with the, the road frontage along Whitewood being cleared out, created a nice open area. Um, and we got some benches, sort of a repurposing some of the downed trees into little benches. Um, there's some more of our repurposing of trees for benches. And then the survey uh, that was conducted by paper form and electronically, uh, what, what rose to the top were park benches. So people really wanted to see that as a, a nice amenity and potentially a natural play area, which we got with that road frontage clearing. Though with our community partners, I reached out with to the Natural Heritage Committee and they are interested in helping with doing a plant identification using uh, QR codes. Uh, the tree stewards have also been um, willing to help out with doing tree identification. And then the Blue Ridge Prism folks who are uh, into you know, identifying invasive species and working to, to try to manage that, uh, we're also willing to, to provide some information. Other achievements, uh, we got a, in 2020, the county completed a boundary survey of the entire park. And in the middle of all the craziness last year, six park benches were installed strategically throughout the park. And recently we had the forest management plan um, completed. So the forest report takeaways, and this is what David Powell and uh, Jonah Fielding um, identified those three portions of the, of the parcel. So there's a forested parcel, an open parcel, and a wetland parcel. And they identified that 
to, to look at the hazard trees within the areas closest to the trail system and look at trying to get those removed, controlling invasive species, and there's also a moderate to high fire risk. Since this is an urban forest, we really kind of need to be mindful of the hazard posed by the deadfall. Fortunately, their, their findings showed there is no right now insect infestation in that forest. So right, right now we don't have to worry about you know, insects potentially um, destroying the forest. Um, the open parcel they recommended, um, since it's potentially a, a great location for wildlife, maybe changing up some of the mowing practices so we avoid injuring nesting animals and continue to manage the, wet, the wetland area for that, for that purpose. So here's the, the, this is the point where we can make some additional recommendations. So as a committee, we, we really could look at preventatively removing all the standing dead trees along the trail system. So it looks like, and Amy, maybe you can jump in, that uh, Parks and Rec have already identified a lot of trees that are close to the trail system that are not looking so great um, for removal. So we could preventatively have them taken down um, hauling them out and maybe chipping on site like the, the limbs. And then managing the existing deadfall, um, again, through an urban utilization program, like through chipping and repurposing trunks and things like that. Uh, the other options we have are uh, upgrading the kiosk. We could start utilizing both sides of the, of the kiosk for, for information sharing. Um, and putting on a new roof. Um, the pavilion, we might consider uh, replacing the bushes with a Virginia native species. The, the plants that are there are actually really a, an invasive. Um, the county also has some little library boxes that it's been installing in other locations. So this might be a really nice location for a library box. Uh, this is a, a example of the plant IDing uh, system that the, uh, the Natural Heritage Committee might be willing to help us with. Uh, we could uh, have all of us, when we feel ready to, help with um, doing the IDing, digging up invasives, and maybe helping prep for some of the chipping work. And of course, in all of this, it should be about an educational outreach. So again, once it's safe, we should all go and celebrate the park. And we've got some great things there, depending on what time of the day and what time of the year you're there, you don't know what you'll find. So um, I will just run through really quick, a uh, couple set of uh, aerials. Um, I was more just curious about the development of this parcel since it's been able to stay forested for almost a hundred years. Um, I went and looked up a bunch of aerial photographs and it turns out that this parcel, which is identified in a 1937 aerial um, that was, uh, you know, forested back then, was actually Albemarle Training School. So I, that, that was just intriguing to me. Um, and then if I go to the uh, UVA has got a fabulous collection of aerials. I'm just going to walk you through this timeline of the development of hydraulic area from starting at 1937 and it's boxed in. So this is 1937. This is 1957, 66, 74, 80, 90, 1996. <laughs> so it, it's been a tree stand for almost 100 years. And that's consistent with the forestry report that uh, they, they believe a lot of the trees are close to about 60 years old. So um, it's, it's kind of remarkable. It's a real gem. And hopefully we can um, keep it you know, going as a, a natural area for you know, maybe another 100 years. Yay.
Does anybody have any questions? This is really great, Kim. Thank you so much. Yeah. You and Amy are a, a team. Any questions? We were talking about bats a few minutes ago. Remember at one point we were talking about making bat houses? Has that ever come up again? I had I think uh, um, I had suggested at one point, this is Diantha, and I can't see if anybody else had any questions, um, but I had suggested it might be fun to do an art project around bat houses uh, for um, down near the, um, the apartment. Yeah, it might be a, a fun art project at some point to involve the community. John? You, we can't hear you, John. Cool, and would be a good display in one of the um, kiosks that we were, sh the county was considering putting up. I think that's the kind of thing that I am certainly, I'm speaking for myself, uh, stop at and read thoroughly when you can see the sense of how much that neighborhood's changed over time. So it's like a historical lesson as well and helps bring appreciation to that park. So something to consider, I love it. I have, I have a question about a bat house. We, I installed a bat house on our garage about 20 years ago. We've never had bats. There's also a bat house at Ivy Creek. Does anyone know whether there's any bat, active bats living in that? Well, I'll, I'll just throw out that the, if you guys are interested in the, um, uh, the forestry report itself, they do, one of the parts of the forestry report is identifying endangered species that might be present in that facility. And there is a type of bat that they identified. So um, I guess we could do that. Um, I don't remember the kind of bat, but it was listed in the forestry report. Yeah, I, I remember having a conversation at one point, Kim, with, um, and I can't remember the lady's name right now, but she was talking about building a specific kind or a type. Anyway, it's just a thought. It would be kind of an interesting project. Yeah, I think we had originally started talking about it in terms of, oh, wouldn't this be a great way to reach out to the school, you know, mm -hmm. one of the grades or something, but, but this is amazing. I think, you know, this work is amazing, so. And, well, and you, I, guys, you guys have any other like things that about the this uh, these yeah if you do recommendations are you guys good with all of this moving forward? Does somebody if you hit the raise hand button or shout out and oh by the way I did see that Ned Galloway is here so I just wanted to introduce him. Can you shut down the presentation for a minute, Kim, just so I can make sure that everybody so that we can put a spotlight on my buddy Ned. But anyway, um, does anybody have any recommendations or do, are we happy with everything that uh, Kim and Amy Rosemary? Um, I love what's been done recently. We go there a lot and I love um, the benches and everything. And um, the idea of the little library, I think would be something that would be really engaging. And I would be happy to volunteer to be a, a parent to the little free library if you want. I think uh, someone needs to kind of keep it moving. So happy to help if I can. That's great. Anybody else? I would just suggest, you remember we had early on, um, Cynthia and Julian, we had the CAC meet and we actually walked the park together. Once we come out of, and sometime this summer, it might be fun for the CAC to get together and do that again thinking about um, our work over there and it might help just for us to get together and do that. I think that would be fun. And think of, and we could walk it, walk it and think about what we might want actually yeah. looking forward. Okay, anybody? Have I have one other little question. I could ask Kim separately, but I know the, um, the kind of open area near the gazebo, the natural play area, um, is there any, um, it kind of goes through stages. I was wondering if there's any other ideas about like keeping, like putting new branches there or putting new logs there or other things as the park evolves or um, I mean, if there are plans for that. I mean, we, that was one of the things Amy and I wondered about in the forestry was this, they, they use the term urban utilization program, which I think is just a way to 
describe taking like dead things and turning it into, you know, useful play things. Um, so, you know, with the work, if we, you know, do some preventative tree work, we could try to figure out what portions of it are useful to add to that. Um, Amy, do you have any other thoughts or John? John, did you have your hand up? Oh, I have, but it's a different topic. Oh. Um, and, and maybe this ties in a little bit to it, if I could just jump in. Amy, do we have any money left from that 30000 that we can utilize for like taking the dead trees down or doing some of this work? We, I see you're nodding your head. Okay, that's good. Yep, we do. We have $20,000 left of the 30000 Yes. So um, <laughs> we definitely can take, and I think Kim was trying to circle us back around to our recommendations. If if everyone is good with it, we'd like to go ahead and take care of the dead trees that are still standing and, and remove okay. those before they become a problem and take care of some of the um, deadfall on the ground and uh, clean up the kiosk area and the little shelter area and the memorial to Charlotte Humphreys, spruce that up and go ahead and move ahead with those projects this spring. Um, and we also have some volunteer groups that have reached out um, there's a St. Anne's class that usually travels away to do a mission trip for a week and they can't travel away. So they would like to spend a week in a park. And if you guys thought it was good, we'd like to, you know, have them go to Charlotte Humphreys Park for a week and they could identify plants, tag trees, Ooh, spruce yeah. up the, shel the shelter, you know, just have them do all kinds of free labor. Mm -hmm. Were there other things from that survey that the 20,000 could be spent on? I feel like there was also like swings and stuff. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. The, also the, the, the highest ranking things weren't the uh, play structures that were like your normal typical playgrounds. It was more of the, the natural play structures, you know, using the, the logs and making, um, you know, stumps and having the kids play on that. So kind of keeping it all more natural. Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably a good idea since you have Greer Elementary so close that has the traditional playground. Keep this one, the natural play areas. Yeah, yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense, John. Um, since Amy and Kevin are on, I'll, I'll ask a question about the, the bike or Greenway, the walking path that starts at Charlotte Humphreys and kind of makes its way over to the, whatever, I can't remember the name of the road, but the road that hits the intersection to the Earliesville Road. And I can't remember the old Greenway plan, um, but is there anything on any map about extending a, a pedestrian path from the intersection of Earliesville Road to Ivy Creek Foundation so that people on foot could get to that that park space and use the same greenway that connects Charlotte Humphreys. I don't know if that's been ever been put on any planning committee or anything like that, but it's pretty open land and there's some power line right of ways and um, uh, something to provide more access to Ivy Creek without having to deal with that dangerous road for, for non um, drivers. Just a thought, tie two parks together, it'd be really cool. De definitely would be very cool. Um, I'm not aware of that, but I can definitely look into it. Um, I'm not sure if Kevin off the top of his head is aware of aware of that, um, but definitely get back to you. I mean, it sounds, I mean, that is a mission of parks to connect parks with neighborhoods, with schools. And yeah, and this, that whole community is, you know, it would be great to have more access to green space and more access to not, you know, not be hemmed in because they're surrounded right now by multi-lane roads. So anything we can do to encourage breaking out of the island, so to speak, I think is really positive for the urban area. I was going to say, Kevin, if you're going to say anything, introduce yourself since some folks may not know on the call may not know who you are. Sure. Uh, uh, Kevin McDermott, I'm planning manager here at Almar County. I'll be talking about the next topic. But, uh, and I appreciate the, the, the thought there. I think it's a, a good idea. I, I've always appreciated the fact that the trail in Charlotte Humphreys does connect from like Whitewood up to that other neighborhood. So it does provide some off street access, but trying to direct people all the way out to Earliesville Road 
and letting people start head that direction. I know that we've talked about other bike pad improvements on Earliesville in the past as well. So it's a, it's a great idea and we can look into it. Well, thank you very much, Amy and Kim. This was really, I think, timely and important and uh, we really appreciate all the work you guys have done for this, so thank you. Yay. Um, but, and, but the next one is Kevin McDermott. Now, if he's the man in charge of like really almost everything, you know, how we get around, you know, VDOT, you know, all that kind of stuff, highways, roads. So anyway, if, if you've been on the, this CAC as long as I have, you'll remember we, you know, we started, there was this NIFI project you know, that we were, we got a little bit of money and what would we do with it? And we decided that we wanted, you know, some sidewalks. And anyway, it's it's coming together and uh, we thought it would be a great opportunity to get an update on that. Um, so Kevin would, if you want to take it away, we're all ears. All right, wonderful. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I've uh, been out here a couple times to talk to you all about transportation projects and uh, as Cynthia and Kim mentioned, th this project came out of the, uh, the NIFI program a number of years ago. It was the, the highest ranking project that we had chosen out for, their, for that program uh, in the hydraulic area. And um, so we moved our funding to that, but what the idea that we wanted to do was be able to connect Albemarle High School with Greer and Jewett uh, because Lambs Lane was really difficult for bicyclists and pedestrians. And so we kind of looked at some options there and we, we realized that the, the funding for NIFI wasn't gonna be enough. So to, to leverage that, we went after a Safe Routes to School grant and uh, that grant was awarded. It was approved and awarded. Um, so the, the project uh, then had a budget of about $700,000, I believe, to work with. And we have been doing design on that project since that, that was awarded. Um, and just uh, last fall, we finally were able to go out for bid on that project. Yay. As we're seeing with just about every project we are trying to do right now, if, if anybody's in construction, uh, they, they know this story. Um, construction costs have gone up significantly recently. And so when we got those bids back, it was over budget from what we had originally anticipated. Um, so we went back to the uh, engineers. We had them uh, take a second look at some things, see if we could tighten up the, the costs on some of them. And the county also was able to identify some additional money that we are able to move to this project to make up that shortfall. So um, that, that money is currently in the process of being moved right now. And we expect to be able to go back out to bid on it in, um, in just probably a few weeks now. And the project is still scheduled for construction this summer in 2021. So we don't think we've really lost too much time. Uh, it's costing a little bit of money, but we were able to find that in, in another budget. Uh, and just a reminder, this is what the project ultimately ended up being. You can see here where uh, there's the Albemarle High School and there's existing sidewalks that get you down through the campus uh, and along that parking lot and connect you to where this point begins. And from across those open fields at the top of that embankment there, that'll be a 10 foot wide asphalt shared use path that we're gonna construct all the way to that intersection uh, that was noted on the, when we were discussing the Boys and Girls Club. It'll come back out onto the road there, cross that little access way, and then go across the frontage of the Boys and Girls Club is a sidewalk and have an additional pedestrian crossing to be able to get you to the existing sidewalks there uh, between Greer and Jewett Middle School. So that is the proposal for the project. We did work with um, the, the design team at uh, Boys and Girls Club. And so we're gonna be 
uh, coordinating on this section of sidewalk that goes in front of their property so we don't build it and then have to rip it out again later during construction and then rebuild it. So, so that'll be a coordinated effort once this is moving forward. Uh, like I said, we're still scheduled for a, um, a summer construction, hopefully be done by uh, fall by the, uh, or approaching time for school next year. So uh, that's where we are with that. And as I was talking about this with Diantha, uh, I pointed out, that we're, actually we had a conversation about Hydraulic Road, Lambs Lane, Whitewood Lane intersection, and some of the issues that have been going on there. And I pointed out that where this project had originally come from was a school travel plan that was done uh, about, about a decade ago now, but that's where the idea came for this. And it also had, other proposals to try and improve some of the uh, walking and biking to this campus area. And so we thought maybe it'd be a good time to, to pull that out and, and take a look at some of those recommendations that were made through, through that program and see if we need to continue to push forward with some of these other improvements. So um, school travel plans are part of the Safe route Routes to School uh, program. And so they're done really to look at all kinds of um, uh, ways that we could increase the number of students who walk and bike to school and increase the safety for them to do that. Uh, it, it identifies things like where they currently walk and bike, uh, where students would walk and bike if there were appropriate facilities, uh, and what kind of short and long-term solutions can we make so that we can improve their, their ability to walk to school. Uh, so that school travel plan identified seven improvements in total all around the campus that, that could be made that would improve biking and walking. Uh, number one is the project that I just discussed. Uh, it was uh, in the plan, it was to do bike lanes and sidewalks on Lambs Road and Lambs Lane. Instead of the bike lanes, we're doing the shared use path that can accommodate both of them. We thought that was probably a little bit uh, better to do, a little less expensive. Um, and then there's a one called the shortcut through path that I'm going to quickly talk about here in a second. Uh, pedestrian improvements at the, at the intersection of Georgetown Green and Hydraulic. Pedestrian crossing at Hydraulic Road and Whitewood, which I just mentioned. Bike lanes on right Whitewood Road, which I think, as some of you know, we worked with VDOT to get those bike lanes installed during the most recent uh, repaving of Whitewood Lane. So those bike lanes are there for most of that length. I, I'd like to extend them a little bit further, but uh, but it's a, a really good improvement they have now already. Um, uh, pedestrian crossing at Georgetown Road and Barracks Road, which was also done already, that was improved back during the time of the sidewalk improvements that we have out there. So now there's there's new pedestrian facilities with the, the, the crosswalk on the pavement and signals. Um, and hydraulic road sidewalk, which was the sidewalk from Georgetown over to Commonwealth that was completed very recently. So a lot of these items we have done, but I just wanted to bring up a few that I think we still need to do some work on. So the first one was what they called the shortcut through path. And this is the image from that travel plan. Uh, down here is that, um, is that uh, other entrance to the school further south on hydraulic. Um, and the recommendation was to improve that road that goes kind of through the campus towards Albemarle and ends by the tennis courts and then give an opportunity for a trail that would connect over to get them to Greer and Jewett. So all the folks that live south of, of this intersection on, on hydraulic would then be able to use this to make a much shorter route than going all the way up to Lambs Road and back in. Um, it looks like some of these improvements have been made. I have not actually worked with the schools to see what all's out there. Uh, they did paint stripe a um, pedestrian walkway along most of this road, although it's just striped in the pavement. It's not a separated sidewalk. And there is a uh, access road that goes around the backside of the field between the baseball field and the, um, and the track here. Uh, but I don't know if that's very well utilized. So maybe 
if folks have thoughts on, on that improvement or if that's a possibility, if it's there or utilized, uh, I'd love to hear it. But that was one of the other, um, ne the next recommendation from the plan. And I'll walk through the other two and then maybe we can talk, we can go back and talk about these if that works best. Uh, so the next one was, like I said, that intersection that's called Georgetown Green, um, south on hydraulics. So it was recommended to make improvements there. And whenever we have, this is the current, up in the top left is the current picture of that intersection. Whenever we have these slip lanes, those we are fairly dangerous for pedestrians. Because what that is doing is it's intending vehicles to be able to make those turns very quickly but if we get a lot of people crossing here, we don't want them to make that quickly. We want them to have to stop and think about it before they make a turn so they're more aware of potential pedestrians walking across there. So that's, that's really one of the problems we have there. Um, and so there were two recommendations made. One was to get rid of that slip lane, make it a much shorter crossing and put in a, a pedestrian crosswalk right there. And the other was just to make this a more high visibility crosswalk. Because as you can see in this, there's not even any lines painted right here. Um, so trying to, to lay down the zebra stripe type crosswalk uh, and possibly even doing a, um, a protected uh, median right here that people could, pedestrians could stop in where they wouldn't be able to get hit by traffic. Uh, so that would be a curbed median. So that was one of the other recommendations. And then the Last recommendation, as I mentioned, was at the hydraulic lambs road intersection. Right now we have uh, crosswalks at two of those intersections, uh, but this is a really high speed route, as everybody knows. A lot of cars move very quickly through there. This, was, this picture was taken before the improvements on Whitewood were done, so those aren't shown on here. But the idea with this is to put high visibility crosswalks on all four legs of that intersection with signals. And that was the recommendation for that. I'd like to take, tighten up those corners as well a little bit to reduce the speed of turning vehicles to make it a little more safe for pedestrians as well. But uh, we can look into that as a, as a separate project. So that was the other one that was recommended um, for out of that school travel plan. Um, and that was all I had for uh, this presentation. I'm happy to go back to any of these points, um, but I'd love to hear the opinions of the folks on the team and answer any questions I can. Bill? So it does sound like you've eliminated the idea. I, I just read that report this weekend fairly thoroughly, uh, the one from May 2012. And um, it, it does sound like you've eliminated the possibility of putting a bike lane down Lambs Road. I assume that's correct. I, I drove it again yesterday and said, I don't see how that would work. And the, I'm a little skeptical overall about attracting more bi biking to school in, in, for people that then have to come onto Hydraulic Road. It seems that even with bike lanes on Hydraulic Road, they're biking to school in the morning and people are going to work and it's kind of the rush hour. I would be concerned about the safety aspects there. Personally, I would focus more on walking and, and you know, improvements for pedestrians. And that leads me to one question, that intersection there that you just showed with um, Lambs Road and Hydraulic, one of the recommendations was for a, a, a island refuge or a pedestrian refuge in the middle of the street I don't that which is not there now I just wondered what whether you're still advocating that Hi, I'll just go get Jack yeah and also whether um crossing are, are we using crossing guards now I, I don't usually go by during those hours but I think that's really important for safety it, it, certainly at that particular crossing I yeah, I, I actually can't answer the question about the crossing guards. I'm not sure if they utilize those at this. I've never seen any. That's not true. Uh, That's not true. Really? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I thank do. You, and, the, and, the, and the afternoon, um, when the bulk of the high school students get out, there is a Oh, you can't hear me? Oh. No, go ahead. There, no, you're there's, good. there's a county sheriff person who is there at the corner of hydraulic and land who controls the traffic light and works to shepherd the kids across the street on that one side. Um, and I would want 
if we, if we do do that four sides, I would, Kevin, I'd ask you to talk to the sheriff's department because I think what that does by having it come across one side, it's easier to manage the flow of the children of the young people across Hydraulic Road to the other side of Whitewood. And if you're having to manage that across both going towards the church, I guess that's north and, and east, that could be um, difficult to control. Plus, I, I would say is that um, I noticed that there's lots of pickups, parent parent pickup. I, should, I don't know if they're parents, I shouldn't say that way. There's lots of vehicles picking up young people that start stacking up um, around the around the church there and coming up and coming up hydraulic that some of those individuals have to be reminded by the sheriff to keep going that this is not a place where you pause to pick up your child or pick up the person you're picking up so so being being judicious on how you manage that track manage both automobiles and young people coming out of coming out of the, the high school property. It's mostly high schoolers. And across the street is something that um, I, I, would, I would suggest you. I think it would be desirable actually to have at least two people there. One to focus more on the children crossing the road and the other like the sheriff's car that, I, that was there today when I went by a little bit late with the blue light flashing um, to focus more on the traffic and and, and controlling that and you know I don't know if you can put up sign there was some talk in that report about no, you know eliminating right turns there or regulating right turns there so anyway those are my thoughts. Great. I, will, I will just add that um, I am receiving some concerns and some comments from citizens who were trying to get across hydraulic from Whitewood and Lambs Road that they don't feel safe and that there are real safety concerns, which is why we're really having this discussion. I didn't even realize this support report existed <laughs> because it's so old until Kevin brought it to us. So this is a really, really good conversation. Um, I do wanna let you know that I have from the police, this is just kind of interesting. The police shared with me, now we're not looking at pandemic year because traffic has been so reduced and kind of much, reduced, but in 2019, the police wrote 253 tickets from hydraulic, on hydraulic, I'm sorry, from Georgetown Road to Burnham Woods. But you so, know, we also talked about how, how it's not marked well. I see a lot of people you can tell that, that are not used to driving there and they don't see those warning you know right and i want to get to that cynthia so there's there is a concern that there's a lot of speeding going through right there there is a, a good amount of speeding and um i just want to let you all know today because it gets at what cynthia is saying i'd reached out to matt haas i don't know a few months ago and said to him we have those flashing signs right those school safety signs that flash the the speed limit that is reduced during certain times of the day. But their wackadoodle is my word because they, they flash when there's vacation, they flash on the weekends, they're not real time and it leads people to ignore them. And what is really cool is that Matt Haas has said we're, and what we found out was that the school division controls those signs as to when they flash and when they don't. It's not VDOT. And what Matt shared with me was the technology in those signs was so old, right, that they needed to be upgraded. And I think it was, I've forgotten if it was $10,000 or what. Bottom line, the school division is going to, to um, um, participate. They're creating their own pilot. And the flashing speed zone signs at the three comprehensive high schools, Western, Albemarle, and Monticello, are all going to be upgraded um, it, to real, so that they will be able to um, control them much more real time for vacations and holidays and everything. Those will be upgraded. They have been already, 
their software has already been um, ordered and they're going to be quickly uh, installed as soon as it comes in. So that will, I think, to some degree, help a little bit in that people will not become so used to those flashing signs, hopefully, that they'll be more accurate, I guess. It's worth a try. That's one thing we are going to be doing. Good to know. Yeah, John. Um, so excited to hear this. I uh, have three kids that have gone through the system, Jewett, uh, Greer. Uh, the two have passed, moved on to UVA. Uh, one is still in high school and he bikes and walks to school. All my kids have biked and walked to school. We're kind of over on the Georgetown side and they all use the pass, the, the sidewalk there. Bikes, skateboards, everyone's using that sidewalk on Georgetown. It's better than nothing. It's great. Um, and I agree, uh, speaking to Kevin's point, that road that comes past Georgetown Green and goes towards high school, that's pretty heavily used by everyone that's south of the school. Um, and so putting in sidewalks, it's dangerous. You've got the Georgetown Green traffic, you've got, and then there's just no sidewalk there. There's some painted lines and it's where all the maintenance people park. So very much interested in looking, making that sort of formally a, a walking or pedestrian friendly spot. And then to your point about the Jewett kids and Greer kids that do walk from Georgetown to Green and such, if they're not taking the trails, they walk uh, and they usually cut right across those athletic fields down to that intersection. Um, but the bikers will tend to go on the gravel road that goes behind the field and between the, the baseball field and the, the football field. So both are used, that, that, that gravel road back there is used a lot. I, I don't think you need to do much there because it gets so little car traffic. It's more just like encouraging people to use it as opposed to um, going through the fields. But if you put in a nice path through the fields there or along the edge of the athletic fields that connected Jewett to the high school, I think that'd be fantastic. And I do one of the, the bullet points that had me really interested in that uh, the NIFI grant uh, and the opportunity to provide a path, a separated safe path between Jewett and the high school was when my daughter was in Jewett and she was taking a high school course, they had to get a bus to drive her from Jewett to the high school and pick her up and take her back. And that to me is nuts when you could theoretically walk the 300 yards or whatever it is. So I'm really excited to see that path coming. I hope that that provides sort of more flexibility for kids to not have to be dependent on a vehicle to take them between the schools. But I know there's other considerations, but that's one of those factors I think is, is really compelling to have a better foot pedestrian opportunity area uh, as opposed to just being driving only. So super excited uh, and happy to help in any way, encourage all, this, all these things that you guys are talking about. It really, I, more and more kids are walking these days. And the, the safer we make it, the better. I will just add, though, what John made a comment about that gravel road. I was back there the other day, Kevin, and there are some really bad potholes back there. <laughs> it needs a little bit of maintenance. While it can stay gravel, but it needs some maintenance. <laughs> so Tim Campbell, and, and we're going to have to wrap this up soon, but Tim has um, um, asked a question about crossing hydraulic multiple times a day at the hydraulic Lambs Road, Whitewood Road intersection. We often have cars drive at us and not see us when turning south into hydraulic. It seems like people are speeding through to make the light. We are at the point where with two people walking, one constantly looks backward to make sure no one surprises. Anything we can do to slow the turning traffic onto hydraulic would be great. Thanks for this discussion and revisiting the plan. Good point. <laughs> It is a, you know, it, it's an iffy road. Yeah, we don't have a traffic turns guard. By, by uh, re, uh, tightening that curb radii could help a lot. Then people can't make that turn as fast as they were going. They have to slow down for it. So that's one option that we can look at for that. Hey, Kim. Uh, the other the other thing I'll, I'll mention, because um, it's probably not on anybody's radar, but the school district did a redistricting exercise back in 2018. So it changed a couple neighborhoods that were, were districted to go to Burley that are now to go to Jack Jewett, which I happen to live in. So half of my neighborhood still remains going to Burley. So they're bust. But then another half is now going to Jewett. And 
there is no sidewalk on Commonwealth Drive. And I know that's another area that we're maybe making headway on um, down the line, but uh, Minor Hill is another neighborhood that got redistricted uh, at that time to, uh, to Jewett. So there's, a, there's another few neighborhoods that are now not, were never part of that original Jewett study for the, the smart routes to school that maybe we can think about. Kevin, you want to address this Commonwealth sidewalk? Uh, yeah, I can I can mention that briefly. So the um, Commonwealth sidewalk was a project that we had funded uh, a few years ago for through revenue sharing. The initial proposal was to put sidewalk from Hydraulic Road heading north all the way to Dominion and then along uh, Dominion between Commonwealth and um, and 29. So, so that would complete that entire stretch. Um, we have been working with the design firm for that. Once again, we, it looks like the construction costs have probably gone up enough that we have to find uh, some, some alternatives, um, maybe break that up into two projects, but it is moving forward. The priority right now is the Southern portion of that, I think between Greenbrier and Hydraulic and trying to get that uh, that area addressed for, so there's continuous pedestrian facilities on that whole length, but should be something coming soon on that one. Okay, well, another great discussion. Everybody's happy Kevin came and, and uh, had this discussion. So we really appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. And let's ask Kevin to come back. <laughs> Cause I think this, there are enough people energized about this discussion that maybe Kevin can come back at some point and make some recommendations or talk us through some of what he might suggest. Cool. That'd sure. be great. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have about nine minutes, eight or nine minutes left. And we have to hear from our liaisons, Julian Bivens and Diantha McKeel. Don't fight over this now. I mean, I don't, I don't have a lot to add. Most of the things that we've been doing from the Planning Commission has been, we've been doing some text am amendments around zoning maps. And we've got a couple of things coming up tomorrow that might be helpful for some people that the, the travel soccer team, which is I think um, Manu Park, the Manu group, they're coming before the Planning Commission on their way, hopefully to, to the supervisors to talk about adding some more fields, not more people, but just der deriving some more fields so that they can rotate the usage of their fields in a way that's more that's more helpful for them. Not more matches, not more cars, just having the ability to rotate their fields. And then the other piece, which is kind of interesting, because this will be the second time one of these has come before uh, the planning commission on its way to the supervisors for for absolute approval if 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 it goes in that direction, is that there's another solar farm that's coming. Um, this time it's over in the Batesville area. And um, as the, the other one was off of um, Milton, so just below uh, be, between um, two, two, 250 up to the intersection where on the way to, uh, to Jefferson's home. Um, but this one's out in, in going past Batesville. And what's interesting about that is that um, it looks like this is, a, this is a, an explored usage for the only that can be put in the rural part of our, of our county, but that the energy is actually coming, going to be used by um, the Central Virginia Co-op. And so there are actually people in Albemarle County who will benefit from, from having access to this kind of energy. And it looks like it's going to forestall for, for, at least for them, uh, having to go and look for other sources because, you know, there are co-ops. So actually they don't generate, but they go and, and bring energy in from other places. And so it'll be interesting to see if this is going to be just the second that, and that's it, or if this is actually a moving in a direction by utilities, by particularly distributors. Um, and, and, and enhancing their enhancing their capabilities and not relying on um, or, or relying more on renewable sources. So that's my only thing. Cool. And I'm gonna I would like to just yield a little bit of my time to Sam from Stonefield because I think everybody always likes an update from Sam on what's happening at Stonefield. It's kind of fun. So Sam, you're there and you're muted, but. <laughs> So thank you so much, Diantha. So when um, Diantha actually mentioned this, I was like, oh, I hope there's a little bit of time because I actually have some exciting stuff. 
Um, so as far as Stonefield is concerned, um, we do have a date for the movie theater. So it is May 14th. So we are less than a month away. So we are working diligently with them on getting everything ready. Um, also, I have some really exciting new leases that have officially been signed. So I can tell you all about some exciting new businesses that are going to be coming in. Um, a few people, probably a lot of you know, Sunglass Hut has actually started their um, construction. So they'll be coming to the town center location. I may have already mentioned that Splendora's that used to be downtown, the gelato shop downtown, um, she is going to be opening up next to Burger Batch. So she is working on getting her inspections done. Um, we have on the north side, closest to Costco, we have Aji Ramen and Sushi. Um, he is in the process of getting permitting for construction. He has a location in Lynchburg. So this will be his second location for ramen and sushi, um, Eric Yu. We also just signed a lease with a gentleman for the hair cuttery space is going to be Ping Hair Studios. So it's an Asian barber shop that's gonna be coming there. Um, who am I leaving out? We have a spot looking at the five, the old five-star space. It's not official yet. Our big news is Pier 1, the former Pier 1 space, is going to be divided into three sections. The one-third of that closest to Hydraulic is officially going to be a Torchy's Tacos. Um, they have signed. We are waiting on the press release from their corporate headquarters. So all of our spots are local. That's going to be our one corporate. They're out of Texas, and this is their first location on the East Coast area here. So we are really excited. They do tacos and margaritas, so who doesn't love that? If you needed more of a reason to come to Stonefield, I can't think of what it might be. So go to Trader Joe's, get tacos and margaritas. So they're all going to be starting construction, and we're hoping to see all of them start opening um, by the summer. So cool. And I, I had lunch at Burger Batch today, sitting outside with my vaccinated friends. I will add that for those of us that are really interested in pedestrian connectivity, the, we now have a staircase, a stairway from, if you think about where um, the uh, Thai restaurant is, down, there's a staircase there that can now go, you can walk down into Stonefield, which is really pretty cool. Not sure the handrail's up yet, but that connectivity. <laughs> I don't think it's up yet, but it's coming. Yes. And I, 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 will, I will say this too. I, um, we, we drove all the way down to Nelson to go bicycling at the bike trail down there. And we don't have one in Charlottesville Admiral yet. So we still need to think about biking options. Right. Three notch right. trail. Mm -hmm. Three notch trail. Let me just quickly, because we're running out of time here, I want to make sure, Ned, you have been awfully quiet. Do you have any comments or anything you'd like to say? Just want to give no, you a chance. Sometimes quiet is better, right? <laughs> um, I just want to know where was my invitation to join Cynthia at the Burger Batch? batch. Um, I think I'm just going to note this for you and I, Diane. The, 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 did Kevin's plan include, I know we talked about the pipeline work that's going to happen in the future, and there was coordination with pathways, walkways, things like that. I just don't know if that was included in that update or not. So that's, I'm just throwing that out there for you and I to maybe follow up on down the road. And we're going to have an agenda item for the CAC about that pipeline, Ned, and yeah. talk about trails and multi-use paths. So. Yeah, yeah, we have, a, we have, we've already really been kind of planning ahead what it is that we're going to, you know, continue to focus on it and because there's a lot. And, uh, but I think this is important you know, that we watch out for Ryo and, you know, Jack Jewett, that, that, that we stay closer. Well, I appreciate you guys letting me, let me listen in today and uh, give me a quick minute here. But I know with Diantha and Cynthia at the helm, I know things are in good hands there. <laughs> Very sweet. We have one minute left and all I'm gonna say is because Ned and I have to make this point that next Wednesday, April the 29th, we have, I'm sorry, April the 28th, we have a public hearing on our budget at six o'clock and it'll be by Zoom. <laughs> so that's a budget public hearing. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, I just wanna thank everybody for coming, staying, participating, listening, getting enlightened. This is really great. Oh, and there's Jackie. <laughs>
<laughs> She's been on the whole time, bless her heart. Yes, I was I was working. That's why I only listened, but I was here. <laughs> well, good work. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, keep hope alive. We'll see each other May May 17th. Thanks a lot. Stay Bye, safe. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.